welcome everyone uh, to this uh, to this OFG Peaceful Change lecture. And um, as a way of introducing, when I came down here, I mean the. When I, when, I, when I heard about the possibility to get this kind of talk uh, to the DA, then I was very, very excited. Because uh, usually uh, in international relations, if one talks about tech, if one talks mm. about space, then it's a very gloomy picture, right? So, it's, uh, so, so tech is oftentimes portrayed as, as, as causing another array of problems. And, and, and if one talks about digital international relations, then it basically is all about cybercrime and, and, and cybersecurity and, 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 and God knows what. But there's obviously an entirely different side uh, of tech yeah, that, that can really help us uh, cope with all kinds of things and, and, and improve the way we manage international affairs. And this is what this talk is ultimately, I think, about. So the title is Disasters and Crises, the Role of Earth Science Information. And the um, speaker is a very, very exciting person. Uh, Dr. Shana McLean uh, from the disaster is a disasters program manager at NASA, and uh, so I've been here now I think for 14 years or so. I, we've never had someone from NASA, so we're very happy about that. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are physically here and you want to take something with you, uh, feel free to serve yourself there. Yeah, so so there are a couple of bags and everything. I got two of them for my, for my children who will be, <laughs> who'll be very excited and very happy about that. And, um, and then without any further ado, I'm going to hand over, Shana, the word to you. She's going to talk for about half an hour and then uh, you have ample opportunity uh, to ask questions then for another 30 minutes or so. Shana. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> So it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I've been telling a few um, people I spoke to ahead of time that I did have the opportunity about 10 years ago to live in Vienna um, and work for the International Commission for the Protection of the Danube River when I was getting my PhD. And so it's really wonderful to be back, uh, wonderful to be able to see Vienna again, um, you know, it's, regardless of whether it's winter or not. <laughs> Um, so what I'm going to do is maybe just talk a little bit about the different experiences that I've had that brought me to NASA, um, how they've essentially influenced some of the questions that I ask at my job and how I lead and inform the future of um, science at NASA and ideally how we all approach the use of earth science information in supporting our own uh, policies, legal frameworks, approaches um, to issues related to disasters, conflict, and crises. And so I have only five slides, so most of them are just going to be me chatting about imagery um, as we go through this. But um, one of the interesting things that I've found around my life, and I'll, I'm sure you're all encountering this as well, is that how we approach a problem is largely dictated by how we define that problem. You know, what parameters we ex understand that we want to work in and how we're going to essentially accomplish a particular objective of go or goal around the parameters that we've defined and set for ourselves. The problem is, is that it's very rare that everybody has created a common language for how they want to approach a similar issue. Um, disasters are very much a problem in this sphere. Um, when you look at imagery like this, um, some of these are considered natural hazards, some of these images are considered natural disasters, um, and others are more situations of crisis or are the result of conflict. How we determine what we're talking about also should be framing how we approach things and how we work together. And one of the things that I've, I've tried to do over, I think, um, the last maybe couple decades that I've been working is use whatever time I have to work with people to help us come to a common set of definitions and therefore a common set of objectives. So let's see, maybe very early on, um, my background is I have a PhD in environmental science and policy. I'm very interested in issues like uh, diplomacy um, and specifically in how we manage uh, international relations across a variety of issues that um, bring our need to share resources together. Uh, so early on when I was getting my bachelor's degree, I had started working for the Nature Conservancy. 
And the work that I did at this time was looking at um, getting people to better understand the need for prescribed fire burning. It was an interesting topic at the time because I think most people tend to think fire is a disaster. Um, it's impacting people, it's impacting lives, but really, if you're coming from environmental science and ecology, you understand that it's a critical part of our ecosystems, right? It's how new trees grow, um, it's, it's how we ensure that there's actually limited amounts of uh, wildfires taking place. Um, it's, it is a natural and critical element for, all of, for nature to have as a part of, of the ecosystem. But at the time that I was doing this work, um, it was very environmentally based. Um, you know, you wanted to get people to think about fire as natural, but we weren't still tackling yet this um, nexus between natural hazards and the human, you know, state of being, right? Like how we develop, how we create some of the situations that lead to disasters. Eventually, um, after working very heavily in more the conservation environmental realm, uh, which I loved, um, I definitely consider myself an environmentalist of sorts, um, I came to start working more in the international governance of, um, of river basins, so multi-level governance of um, basins across uh, the Orange Senku, so across southern Africa. I also studied the Murray-Darling River Basin and the federated um, approach to managing their shared water resources um, in extended periods of drought, um, and started to look more at how we are able to not only manage the water, but what it means in terms of sustainability and resilience. How do we ensure that we're managing the water in a way that allows for enough water for future generations? It's a challenge, right? Especially as development increases, the need and demand for water increases. Um, the, even if there are legal frameworks that ha tend to protect these elements and approaches, they don't always, um, they don't always achieve their goal. Uh, there are trade-offs that have to be made um, in order for economies to grow, people to have robust lives. But this intersection started to really interest me, these trade-offs that we made, um, trade-offs across countries, trade-offs between human need, human demand, and nature, um, and what this would mean in times of not just how, like, in terms of our future, but also in what this means in terms of how we manage short-term preservations or uh, disasters or protracted crises, all of which can you know, impact any river basin in the world because this is essentially, you know, most of our societies are built around rivers. Um, so, you know, I think that I started seeing, I started working more at the intersection of these trade-offs between humans and the environment. I think at the time I ended up working with the Environmental Law Institute for a time with international and environmental lawyers who were trying to um, essentially educate um, international entities, uh, national governments on these issues related to natural resource management and peace building. Uh, natural resources tend to be a common reason why people enter into conflict. Um, not necessarily the, the water wars that you hear, like plastered all around you know, the media, but more you know, local, very small conflicts because there's shifting availability of food sources for cattle, um, or there's degradation of resources because of pollutants, um, or inequitable sharing, right, of the value of the resources that the governments are getting because maybe the governments are corrupt or there aren't mechanisms to, to ensure equitable sharing. In any case, again, we're faced with these, the, this conflict, this, you know, kind of tension between the environment and um, and, the, and the human state of being. So I think what's informed me, particularly as we started to work in disasters, so I moved into from the conflict and migration and peace building sphere, um, and I lived in Geneva for a while, so I started working with a, a specialized unit of the UN, uh, UN OCHA, which is the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. This group looks, um, it, it literally coordinates all of humanitarian response um, and assistance. Uh, for UN member states around the world. Um, but we also worked with UN Environment Program, UNEP. And the goal at this, um, at this office was to better understand how to incorporate considerations of the environment into humanitarian decision-making. 
And this is where I think I finally found, you know, a lot of excitement about the possibility of how we could start looking at, at um, I think, complex crises, complex disasters, because the truth is that, you know, they're severe. I mean, we talk about silos all the time, but, you know, the work I've had, you know, I was either an environmentalist working to preserve conservation and talk about nature, or I'm talking about society and the need for water and the demands against nature, but we were never really figuring out how to balance the humanitarian and environmental needs that are coming together and are often at strife. Um, and that lead to a lot of the conflicts and crises that we're talking about. And so in this job in particular, we were trying to integrate environmental considerations into humanitarian efforts. Um, this is a, a historic challenge because for every dollar of humanitarian aid, what happens is um, it's, you know, it's colored, right? It's designated for specific um, funding mechanisms. A portion of money ensures that there's water, sanitation, and health considerations. A portion of the money goes to education, uh, to gender or social inclusion elements, but there's no marker for the environment. And so if you consider how many, there's a, a disasters happen on average one and a half times a day everywhere in the world, right? If we've got a disaster happening one and a half times a day, you've got humanitarian response deploying to all of these disasters around the world, and the environment is not something that we're considering when we're deploying people, then you end up in situations where you're continuously putting people in increasing situations of vulnerability. I mean, this is, fragility is the opposite of resilience, right? So, you know, if we're not thinking about the environment, then you've got a situation um, like the image on the left, which is, um, uh, it's the Rohingya camps in Bangladesh. Um, I went there in 2019 to do some landslide work. In, or, in, in a rush to get space for people, the land was terraformed, the trees were removed, and then after people were there, they realized there's a monsoon season. And what happens when there's no trees and there's just dirt and there's a lot of rain? You're now subjecting the most fragile people in the world to landslides and flash floods. They have nowhere to go. They have nothing left. And now they also face death because we failed to consider the environment when we were making space for them. So you're probably like, what does this have to do with NASA? So one of the things that's been interesting to me and why I came to NASA was that um, a lot of times I think part of the problem tends to be not only in the framing um, of whether we consider something a natural disaster or a natural hazard, but also how um, we're able to use science to influence how we are able, how we see or visualize the changes that are occurring around the world. And so one of the challenges that I've had and that I, I continue to have to this day is helping to start or at least contributing to those who want to reframe and make sure that people understand that even though historically we've used the term natural hazard or natural disasters, um, that there are just no more any natural disasters, right? The way that we develop the world, the challenges and trade-offs that we're making, they're creating the exposure and the vulnerability that sets us up for increased impact over time. And so natural hazards, you know, hurricanes, in the ocean that haven't impacted people, fires in the forests, earthquakes, et cetera, they will continue to happen. And of course, climate change is, is moving you know, the needle on how frequently we see some of these, in the, these disasters but, or these hazards um, you know, with their frequency, but the truth is it's really how we're growing and how we're developing that's causing the disaster itself. And so it requires a shift. Um, we can see a lot of things with, with Earth observations. The satellites that NASA and ESA and other um, space agencies have and commercial industries have to visualize the world continuously allow us to get a very good and clear picture of how things are changing over time, whether it's water resources, land resources, etc. But if we're really going to move from understanding how, what the hazard looks like and how that's changing, to really move us towards getting ahead of a disaster before it happens, disaster avoidance, um, disaster mitigation, prevention, preparedness, um, it's gonna mean that we need to adopt a common way of approaching these elements, a common framework, a common language, so that we can move forward. So, I took over the disasters program at NASA two years ago. Um, I've been working at NASA for about seven years. 
but I have a lot of interests. Uh, disasters of, are of interest to me, but I'm also interested in um, obviously the human element. This has been a core component of everything I look at, but um, also bringing different approaches and ideas together, I think are absolutely critical for how we move forward. And so um, a large part of the portfolio that I inherited um, were, were uh, elements of the program that looked at the evolving nature of natural hazards. This is absolutely critical. It's a baseline function for how we understand our changing world, but it doesn't help us get ahead of the disaster if we're not looking at issues of exposure and impact. And so I'm just gonna talk through a couple of these examples that I do manage for the program currently, um, how I think we are where we are today, at least at NASA, um, and then move that into like where I'd like to see us go and um, ultimately maybe what we can have a conversation about in regard to your interests as well. So we know that landslides, um, you know, these, it's, a, it's a massive, they have massive impacts uh, across communities. They kill thousands of people every year. They're highly localized, very difficult to model and track. Um, so most of the work that we've been doing, uh, this is on the left-hand side of the screen, is a new model that's been developed over the last several years by a team out of NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. It's the Landslide Hazard Awareness and Situational Assessment Model, the LASA model. Um, but essentially what they're trying to do is move beyond the natural hazard alone, you know, take global um, approaches, global models of landslides and downscale them so we have a better understanding not only of wh which areas are more susceptible to landslides, but what that means in terms of exposure of different communities to those, um, to those landslides. And so in Guatemala, uh, last year, there were a series of landslides. Um, and this model, we were working with the government of Guatemala in order to integrate our landslide capabilities so that they would at least have an understanding of where there was more or less likelihood of landslides to impact their communities. The problem is that we're still not really getting to the understanding of vulnerability, right? You know, we know that these people are exposed, but what does it mean in terms of impact? Like how many people are gonna be able to leave their homes ahead of time? How many will have to stay because they're, they don't have the economic or other types of approach, you know, uh, capacities necessary to leave? Um, how many will be stranded um, and left behind because of this? And what does it mean in terms of recovery or ultimate resilience? We're just not there yet. On the right side, we've got a flood model. Um, you know, there are millions of flood models around the world. Um, everyone has their own version of one. Uh, I would say that what we've been trying to do is not recreate another flood model, but rather bring in um, and integrate, start in taking the various flood models that exist, use them to calibrate and validate how we understand flood changes to different societies, and automate them so that we can get a little bit more ahead of the game. Um, someone was asking me about early warning earlier. Um, in all of these instances, these are things that don't get us in the sphere of early warning, but they do help with early action related uh, approaches. With the floods, again, um, this is integrated, automated, like uh, harmonized approaches. Uh, people also call them an ensemble approaches. The intent here is to be able to, down to the catchment level, understand where floods are likely to happen around the world. So downscaling you know, is ideally where we're getting better and better at, um, but again, the science really needs to be there, and the next step is getting to understanding how this, what this means in terms of our lives. The middle model is something developed by a catastrophe modeling firm out of California called ImageCat, Inc. Uh, this is the Global Economic Disruption Index. It was used for the Turkey and Syria earthquakes that happened last year. Um, the benefit of this um, effort is that it's using harmonized approaches again, but I mean, we've got some remote sensing, earth observations. It's also combining economic information, as well as a lot of uh, information regarding like lifelines, uh, transportation, energy networks, et cetera. What we do when we run this model is get a better sense, not only of which areas are susceptible to certain impacts, but what, it's gonna, what those impacts are gonna look like. Are there going to be roads out? Where are the roads most likely to be out? 
Will there be down power lines? What kind of economic impact are we likely to see as a result of a different type, like what it, multiple types of hazards? So this is helpful in part to informing humanitarian response efforts. They need to pre-position supplies, know where to go. We can use this information to help them there. It's also critical to parametric insurance industries, um, people who are interested in understanding how fast or long it's gonna take communities to recover. And what does it mean in terms of payouts for people who are impacted by these events? The longer it takes for you to recover, this is a proxy for resilience, right? If we're not able to recover fast, you're less resilient. This gives us an understanding and, and maybe a, even a, a small step towards getting to where I think we need to go as we move forward in this sphere where we're still advancing the science for hazards, we still understand that hazards are dynamic processes, that we need to advance science continuously to understand, particularly with climate change, but communities are changing to how do we get closer to understanding what the impact looks like and what it means in terms of how fast we can recover, how much, um, how long we're gonna be you know, having a like completely downed economy, people unable to return to work, et cetera. So the this is my final, well, no, I think I have one other slide after this, but you know, I think the, the human context is the most pernicious or, or challenging, also sneaky, one for us to handle. Um, in each of my jobs, as I told you, I mean, you deal with the people whose kind of mandate it is to, to serve certain functions. And in no job that I've worked up until recently, has anyone wanted to look at the entire system of how we approach things? When I was working for the Nature Conservancy, I was looking at nature. When I was working for the UN, even when I was trying to integrate nature, I was still working to save people and human lives. And when I came to NASA, I thought, this is it. I can use satellite data, I can work with humanitarian organizations or others, and I can like really finally change the needle. Everybody told me, we look at the system, we see the Earth system, we see it changing. There wasn't a single person being considered <laughs> in any of the work we were doing. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm vastly interested in, that I'm trying to change how we approach, frankly, all of the sciences with, um, you've got physical scientists, you've got social scientists, they rarely work together, or maybe they don't work together in a common framework or under a set, common set of rules or guidelines, but we need to be able to start looking at system complexity that includes the environment, it includes the human changes that are happening, and what those feedback loops amount among these two elements look like. The climate is part of the environment, but it's even now being treated as though it's completely separate and that we don't need to understand foundationally how our environment is changing before we start providing climate services. And I find this very challenging. Because if we're not looking at how the water's changing, how our agriculture is changing, how security, right, for all of these elements around the world is changing, how will we ever get ahead of any of these events? And so, I don't know where I'm at with time. It's fine. Okay, I'm just, <laughs> I have a few small points. So this is a lot of words. Um, I'm just gonna say a few things about this. So, when I worked at the UN, I had this amazing boss, uh, Vladimir Sakharov, um, from Russia, who would tell amazing stories, but he also had a very phenomenal approach in my mind to what I think diplomacy is. He said that when we work together, when we work in teams, we never invite our enemies. And that this is the critical problem that we all face, right? If I'm at the Nature Conservancy and I'm talking about nature, I'm just surrounded by my friends, you know? How do we really work towards a system unless we're inviting people with different perspectives who don't agree with us, who have different, you know, they've experienced a different type of life than we have that understand intrinsically the system much differently than we do. And so a lot of the things that I think we need to do to start adopting a more systems perspective so that we can get ahead of issues related to disasters, conflict, crises, is to start inviting our enemies, to start working with people who have different perspectives. Um, at NASA, there are a lot of Earth system scientists, but again, the human element is missing. And because I have a social science and a physical science degree, 
what we've been having critical conversations on recently is how we're going to be more inclusive and diverse with the communities that represent, that we fund through science, that we have represented across our teams um, it, within headquarters, and that how this will then ideally start putting us on the path to more integrated and systems approaches for understanding complex change. That's one element, right? Just creating new communities, getting different perspectives. It's much harder than it sounds. A lot of the institutional processes that we have across our organizations or governments um, are not built to be adaptive or agile. And so it takes a lot of work to get us there, but it's well worth it. This I know for certain. There are also these approaches that we need to take. I mean, I think one is to create a new community. It's also about how to change um, some of the way that we approach the methods of looking at things. So we know that science and technology move rapidly. I mean, it's always fascinating to me at NASA. I mean, we plan for satellites, you know, 10 years in advance, but even the satellites you plan for deliver multiple more payoffs than what you planned, right? I mean, we launched ISAT-2 a few years ago. It was meant to study glacial um, change and, and you know, a lot of different things related to water um, and sea level rise. Turned out it was amazing for understanding wildfire. I mean, it's actually paid off just over, over, the, over the top with, um, in terms of better understanding fire damage um, across communities. Um, so being able to advance some of these elements um, and understand like a flexibility in thinking is something that we also need to change. So we know that science is evolving, our global societies are evolving, but we're not able to pair those components in ways that have the satellites or the science and the technology actually start to serve those changes and better visualize and understand the changes that are happening. We see like developments with digital twin modeling. These, are, these elements still are only looking at how uh, Earth system dynamics are playing out. We have not yet gotten to the point where we're able to understand what that means in terms of impact to communities. And then finally, I would say um, it's not just about changing who you talk to or the ways that we approach science in support of policy making, decision support, and tool development, et cetera. We also need to be able to tell the stories better of what the difference that these approaches meant. We always hear about the stories of how much money a disaster cost us, right? How many lives were lost. But we rarely hear the stories about what we did, how much we saved, how many lives were saved because we acted early, because we prepared. One of the things I do at NASA is also lead a consortium based on socioeconomic assessments. How can we work with economists more? How can we reach across and get people working together to say, if I use a particular set of information, how will that improve the work that I do? How will it lead to impacts on the economy that are positive, impacts on society that are positive, and how can I get that story out so that we start moving the, the, the way that we work, we start framing the story around counterfactual evidence, around the benefit of prevention and preparedness, and then ideally, as a cultural global society, move towards that together as well. So uh, I guess I'll end here. Um, hopefully this is okay time-wise, but these are the things that I think about. Um, it's where I wanna see the science at NASA head. And certainly with the disasters program, this is where um, if you follow what we do, then you'll see us start moving towards um, pretty heavily um, in the years to come. Thank you very much. <laughs> Shana, thanks a lot. Uh, it was a great talk. Um, I, I would have, I'm very interested in these kind of things. I would have lots of questions. But I know that you are a very eager audience and a very active audience. <laughs> so I'm going to hand over the word straight away to you. And anticipating quite a few questions, I'm always going to bundle three. Okay. 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 <laughs> so I hope I haven't, <laughs> I haven't promised too much. So who wants to ask questions? Yes. So... One, two, three, yeah. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my name is Luz Sentner. I'm a student of the Diplomatic Academy in my second year. 
And I was interested um, whether, because you talked a lot about uh, sort of top bottom approaches towards um, resil uh, disaster resilient efforts, um, whether there are, are any bottom up approaches that can get civil society more involved and in sort of yeah, involved with disaster resilience efforts. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, that's if right. I'm Three. I, bad memory. <laughs> I already told you. <laughs> Good afternoon, hello, it's a pleasure to have you here. My name is Sarah Lee, I'm a second year student here at the Academy. And you mentioned early warning systems. How would you address the issue of getting these early warning informations out to these vulnerable and marginalized victims and groups out there in communities? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for your talk, it was super interesting. I'm also a my two student, my name is Miriam. And you talked about how to bring the human communication in. And I was thinking about, should we also think about the decision makers and how to bring the information to them? So that's why my um, question would be, in what ways does NASA involve fostering partnerships when it comes to like government agencies or NGOs or stakeholders? And how could they ensure, for instance, the implementation of these um, disaster management strategies? Thank you. Thank you. Shana. Okay. <laughs> I try to play by the rules. I don't know. I'm not very good at it. Um, <clears throat> so bottom-up approaches. Uh, I think there are, you know, I'm going to maybe cluster the, the last and the first questions. Um, I work in the, so across NASA, we look at multiple different things, right? More best known probably for what we do with the moon and Mars. Um, the Sun and our heliophysics divisions, our planetary science division, which launched the James Webb telescope. But I work for the Earth Sciences Division, which isn't you know, very well known, but still absolutely critical. Um, and within applied science, well, within the Earth Sciences Division, we, you know, we advance technology, we advance data you know, through our satellite missions, and then we essentially branch out into two core components on how you use the data. One is research. Um, these are like hypothetical approaches, like can we do something? Um, it also allows us to uh, explore the modeled you know, elements uh, that often make their way into early warning systems. Uh, so this is called research to operations, where you're building algorithms, modeled capabilities that are part of a network of information that goes into what cr creates an early warning system. There's also the applied science or earth action side of the earth sciences division, and that's where I work. And the work that we do across earth action is really focused on scalability and partnership. Every project that we work on, every, every grant that we give, it is partner-led. So it is decision support that is developed with the partner. So it's practitioner and scientists working together to develop a tool together that will answer the questions that the partner has directed us that they need an answer for. And the idea is to be able to build these capabilities so you can ultimately transition them into our partner's platform so that they can use it, they can sustain it, they can scale it across whatever networks or communities they're working in. So applied science and decision makers are absolutely critical to every single thing we do across the disasters program, but also across all of applied sciences, where we also look at food and water security, infectious diseases and health, um, energy and sustainable infrastructure, et cetera. Now, the problem with this, and, you know, and thus your question regarding bottom-up, is that a lot of the work we do is very local. Uh, we're trying to move away. I mean, global data sets are good for giving you an understanding of change on average, but they don't dial into what those local impacts look like. And so the majority of our work tends to be local, it's bottom up, but the challenge tends to be with that, an issue of scalability. If you work from a bottom up, you're very localized in your decisions, it's much, diff much more difficult to then say, okay, well, in the city next to this approach, can we use the same capability? The answer is we can use the same approach, but we largely have to redefine and redo the science so that it's specific to the community we're working in. Um, I'm a big believer in bottom-up approaches. This is how you get closer to the, cha the changes that you need to make. Um, but w in terms of replicability, scalability, transferability, science is really, you know, it's very challenging there. Um, and I would say, you know, scaling up or scaling down is a lot of the decisions, right? You lose the local flavor 
um, of what you're trying to get to, and that's problematic given that disasters um, and crises are inherently local. And I'll just say one more thing about the early warning system element. Um, so in the RNA side, we do a lot of work on the research to operations um, side of the house. Uh, within the U.S. government, I would say, we've got operational entities that have mandates to deliver early warning. Uh, this is NOAA, right, the National Oceanic and um, Atmospheric Administration. So because they're operational, like it is their role to give the early warning to communities around the United States, what we do is we work to advance the science, to advance the, the algorithms, the approaches that they ultimately then integrate into the work they do. But it's not NOAA alone. Um, what you tend to see on the applied science side is how we work much more internationally to develop the early warning systems ourselves with our partners. So we know, um, largely because of issues like the Early Warning for All initiative that's recently come out of the WMO, and all of the actors, including UNOCHA and the Red Cross, that are partners of, of all of this effort, we need to get better at ensuring that there are early warning systems across countries you know, around the world. And everyone's at different capacities. And so I think some of the challenges there is that we work heavily in this sphere, um, but there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and there are a lot of problems with it. Um, I think there's a rush to, you know, maybe I should stop soon. I'll just say one last thing. Everyone is in a push to get to multi-hazard early warning systems when many countries around the world don't even have early warning full stop, right? And if you rush to multi-hazard, multi some of the problems that we're starting to see is that people are treating a lot of hydrometeorological hazards as though they are second, like they're um, disconnected, that they have nothing to do with one another. So the way that people approach floods are different from landslides, and yet we know that they're interlinked, you know, intrinsically. And so some of what I would ha hope that happens as we start to move forward with like the early warning for all initiative is not only that we're advancing the science, getting people so that we're all on the same level where we all have access to this kind of information, but that we can also start treating hazards as though they're coupled and interacted, interconnected, um, which will then start getting us on the track, I think, of really getting ahead of disasters in the right way. Hey, thank here. you. <laughs> uh, Don't next, get me started. Next, next <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it's, it's really super interesting stuff. And I think very, very relevant for our time. So the, yes, there were, there were two over there, and then we're going to move one. <coughs> there as well. Hello, my name is Steven Fuchs. I'm actually just a guest and a student from the Tec Technical University. Um, and most of my questions have been answered already, yet the second one I was about to ask is, what if we don't make the cut? What if uh, preventing systems fail and we have, certain models suggest that we have less than 20 years to reach the last tipping points of certain equilibria. So are there any plans, for example, by NASA to act in that way, you know, to yeah. remove or whatever? Thank you. Thank Excellent. You. I can't even remember. Yeah. My name, is <laughs> my name is Pete Dan. I'm, I'm a first year at this academy, and my question is, because from your talk I kind of hear an increasingly holistic and integrated scientific almost think tank at NASA that kind of understands the entire Earth system as such, but also on the political sphere an increasingly tense situation between like local governments and national governments that struggle with the scarcity, increasing scarcity and sa safety of resources like water. And, all the disasters that we create through it. So would you say that also attaching to his question, do you see a trend towards kind of like top-down implementation and the states just being a hurdle on the way there? Mm. Or do you see an increasing convergence of these two camps in dealing with transnational issues? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you very much. My name is Rima Bukinam, my stu. Uh, that was very interesting information and so many activities that you've been doing. You mentioned management, operational management, sci scientific research. It's, it's incredible. So, uh, as I understood, uh, the organization is doing scientific research, so collecting different information data, uh, and then it should be operationally implemented. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm curious to understand is, how do you feel? How is the interest? Thank you. I'm, I don't eat it. <laughs> so, 
how do you no, 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 she needs it uh, because it's for the stream. <laughs> Sorry. It's for the stream. Um, how do you evaluate uh, the interest of from the operational side? Mm. So you produce a lot of information, yeah? Is the in interest, is it increasing now, or you still produce more than the interest? Or maybe inter there is a higher interest than you produce? Just interesting to understand it. It's an excellent question. That's my favorite, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to know this very well by the end. Um, so on uh, the first question, does you know what happens when prevention doesn't work? Um, this is a fascinating element. Um, this is incredibly uh, sensitive for a lot of governments to deal with, um, namely because of this question about trade-offs. And so I would say my, my answer is, uh, I do work in this sphere. Um, I believe in planning for global cat catastrophic and existential risk. Um, and there are spheres um, around the world that are starting to look at this. I mean, we've been talking about issues like black swan events and things like this for quite some time, but it's a much different matter to actually plan and budget and prepare for these things, right? To plan and budget is one element. To actually prepare to, to, to change the way we do things on the ground is a whole other matter. Um, when I started with NASA, actually, I was very interested in solar flares, for example. Um, there's a periodicity to how often they happen, um, and when they're at their peak flare, there is a I mean, a larger chance than I would like that they could cause incredible damage across, across just entire continents. They could wipe us out into complete darkness for extended periods of time. There just isn't enough redundancy in our technology and infrastructure sectors to prepare for this. We're not there. And when I talked to the government about this, they were like, how do I put, prioritize putting money towards something that is very unlikely to happen versus that that is happening all the time today. And so these trade-offs, they keep us from planning and preparing, even if we don't necessarily need to have a gross budget dedicated to how we move forward, you know, that's, it's stymieing some of our progress there. And so I would say recently, uh, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction um, has really started looking into this. I've been part of a committee that's designing um, some of the policies that we could consider, some of the, you know, top, I think it's like top seven or 10 global catastrophic or existential threats that we can see likely within our own lifetime. Um, and then even across the United States government, we've been having conversations about these as well. Um, and so I, I feel like it's kind of surprising to me that in the last seven years, we're, I'm starting to see a, a better uptake of it. It hasn't gotten us to actually changing how we you know, how we plan and budget for these things, but it is getting the messaging on the table. We're having critical discussions about it, and I think as long as we start to communicate and understand these issues exist, at least as it puts us in the right direction. So excellent question. Regarding the trend in governance, um, you know, it's interesting. I've worked in conflict and peace building for about 14 years now. And I think um, I definitely started at a time when everyone wanted to talk about water wars and how water leads to conflict. And obviously, there's a lot of conflict going on, but conflict escalates over time. You know, I mean, it starts as, I mean, there are a lot of reasons. It's very complicated uh, matter, right, when we devolve into conflict. But I would say that there is an entire group of, of um, scholars and practitioners around the world dedicated to highlighting all of the times, all of the stories when countries and governments work together towards peace instead of conflict. Um, there's the Environmental Peace Building Association. And, you know, I think that it's hard to see it sometimes because strife and conflict and despair or what we sell every day in the news, but frankly, I see much more often countries working together, cities working together, people working to find shared solutions to limiting or depleting resources than I do have seeing it move in another direction. I have faith that we will continue on this course, but I would say that it does, I mean, our population isn't slowing. And so as we see a deplete, like an increasing depletion of our source resources and we've got these impacts of climate change, the need to really focus on shared solutions becomes even more important. Um, 
And so I would say, you know, this is a question we should be asking ourselves every year for the next several years, right? I mean, how do we stay on track? How do we make sure we're having the right conversations? And, you know, how do we make sure that we, we keep it in the realm of peace instead of um, war? And then um, regarding the operational elements for um, evaluating interests. So the benefit of working in applied science, I, I don't... I believe in research, I think it's absolutely critical, right? Where are we without theory? That's how we get to, I think, being able to create practical solutions on the ground. But for me, um, I want to tackle what we deal with in life. And I think that we have pressing need around the world and everything we do is, de is dictated by the partners that we work with. And so we are inherently operational because on one hand, the grants that we give um, to scientists um, or and and to the the practitioners they work with, are partner led, right? So they're um, in the program. Like so, the two of the work, uh, two of the examples I gave you, the floods and the landslides. These were work uh, developed with the Pacific Disaster Center, which is based out of Hawaii. But it provides a global early warning system to multiple countries. Um, but also to multiple international interests around the world. So PDC told us what their needs were, and we worked with them to integrate the landslide and flood models into their early warning systems. Um, the other way I evaluate need is I constantly hold, I invite people to have stakeholder workshops with me. I mean, it's up to you to attend, but like, you know, the goal is, you know, I, I don't believe in throwing something against the wall to see if it sticks. It's a waste of partner time. It's a waste of our scientific resources. It's a waste of my time, right? Because it doesn't really give me insight into what the problems are and how things are headed, right? I mean, the farther I am away from the problem, the less likely I am to create a solution. And so therefore, um, being able to be connected to our stakeholders, I think becomes a, an absolute drumbeat that you have all the time. At NASA, what's been interesting is over the last maybe seven years or so, we've also developed a satellite needs working group. A lot of the times, historically, when we built satellites, we had scientists telling us where we needed to go. But now we are much more dedicated to ensuring that every satellite we build is serving our agency partners and the sectors that we deal with so that it's not just about advancing science, but that it's about advancing science for benefits to society which may not be a clear change, but in previous satellite developments, we were never thinking about the decision support tools that we needed to develop with the science. We were simply asking what if. And now, in every single mission that we develop from now on, the stakeholders' needs are going to be the driving force of how our satellite and the data that comes from it are delivered to people. This is pretty monumental. So I would say operations are absolutely critical across everything we do within the Earth Sciences Division. Thank you. And I anticipate one more round, right? So, so you had your hand up beforehand. <laughs> and then, and then we, have, we have two more, and then three more, and then I'm gonna abuse my <laughs> prerogatives as a chair and also ask questions. Okay, well, you gotta be nice. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Camille Fourmi. I'm a Maestro student here at the Diplomatic Academy. And you were talking about the trade-offs and also about new approaches. So I wanted to have a little bit of an economic question. Sure. In today's climate finance uh, landscape, we're putting way more efforts and finance towards mitigation and way less towards adaptation, which makes up, I think, less than 10%. And I wanted to ask you how effective you think this is if this is how it should be, and if not, how we could make more efforts towards adaptation, how we could motivate more investments. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And then Caleb, I think there was another question over... Oh yeah, there, one, two, three, good. Thank you very much. Uh, my name's Johannes, I'm a second year my student at the Academy. Uh, thanks so much for your, for your presentation. Um, you spoke about framing disasters and un like building knowledge about understanding how they how they work. And at, at the local level, I have a question about: um, Is there any complementarity between the science on one hand and indigenous approaches and indigenous knowledge structures? Um, do they fit together? And does NASA take that into into account? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And then Caleb, and there's one more one. Yeah. 
Um, thank you so much. Um, it was a pleasure listening to you. My name is Dana Bogdan. I'm a former DA student, and now I'm working for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Um, it was indeed amazing to hear what you're doing because this is very much overlaps with most of uh, the portfolio that I'm dealing with now, so I'm sure we'll get a chance to meet each other and get to know each other better. My question is very um, short one um, because I noticed that you mentioned that disasters are not um, natural, they are anthropogenic, and we do have, let's say, a uh, different vision that there are um, natural and man-made disasters. So we, we still look at uh, disasters from that perspective. I was wondering how do, you, how do you see it only of anthropogenic nature, especially for earthquakes and tsunamis and things like that. Thank you. Yeah, and then I'm gonna, I, wanna, I wanna ask a selfish question about something to do with, my research, with one of my research projects where it's about tech diplomacy. Okay. And, uh, and a lot of things that you, that you, that you said that is, that is really cutting edge science and, and a lot of tech involved, mm -hmm. satellite imagery and, 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 and all of that. And, uh, and I was wondering to what extent diplomacy, so traditional diplomats obviously not trained in that kind of stuff at all, to what extent they actually open up to these, these, these kind of questions, yeah? So how easy you, f you find it actually to, to cross this, let's say, science, applied science on the one hand, and, and diplomacy, this, 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 this gulf on the other? Because it seems to me that it has a lot of repercussions, right? So uh, some, some, some of the questions were about so who are the, the political actors there, and, mm -hmm. And you have a UN background, and then argue, and then we have all kinds of UN documents. So, so space sort of for peaceful use and for humanity, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and all of that. And there seems to be a whole big diplomatic agenda somewhere, uh, somewhere hidden in, in all of that. What you what you do? Like I have a diplomatic agenda? No, <laughs> there should be. <laughs> well, no, I know what the statement. It's so sneaky there should be. that no, it, no. I missed it. <laughs> there should be. No, no. There, I think there, there, there should be, right? Oh there yes. Be. I mean, so, so if we if we think about something like like summit of the future in in, in, in September, then then that's probably the UN summit of the future. And then there's probably this this uh, there, there is a there's a tech envoy now and everything. So there seems to be a lot of. Some things seem to be moving into that direction, but probably not enough. Yeah. But yeah. Yes. Um, so that's the fourth question. That's I'm going to come question. back to that. Yes. So <laughs> yeah. I'm going to answer the three, and then I actually yeah. have a question for you, and then I'll answer yes. you. Um, so let's see economic, um, climate, finance, mitigation, and adaptation. So um, <laughs> these are things that I, I think are very interesting. Um, I also think that this is, these, these are my opinions just so we're clear. Um, uh, but this is one of those critical elements between how we treat climate versus the environment. You know, mitigation tends to fall in, you know, carbon capture and greenhouse gas emissions and how these things are changing. Now, obviously, how we can change our behaviors, how we adapt, you know, can then lead to changes in how, you know, we're emitting different pollutants into the atmosphere and causing, you know, the climate problems that we're facing. But sometimes I feel like there's a rush, again, to push towards climate financing and before we understand truly what ad adaptations we need to make. Um, within our, how we interact with the environment. And so, I mean, you see a number of entities moving into, I mean, what do we call it now? There's adaptation, there's transformation, there's resilience. All of these end up on some sort of like temporal uh, scale. Um, and frankly, you can't get one from one to the other unless you're able to really start at the basic question of adaptation. You know, what is the problem we're trying to solve? You know, how do we change not only you know, how we do things, but get people thinking differently. And I feel like some of the problem begins with, and this isn't a perfect, you know, answer to your, your question, but we don't assess enough or evaluate often enough the adaptations that are taking place, which is, you know, I think tends, up, tends to then feed this monster of like climate financing and climate services. Adaptations are sneaky, right? We change our behaviors every day in minor ways, particularly when we're impacted by stressors, right? Um, and so they're not acknowledged, they go hidden, 
It doesn't mean that people aren't adapt adapting all the time. It just means that we're not capturing the value in those adaptations and then showing how, the value of what that means to society around the world. And so you, and then you become part of this like political element which wants to rush to climate finance. I, th I think that it's incredibly valuable. Mitigation is important. We can't do without it. Um, however, I, it needs to be more balanced in my mind. And in order for it to be more balanced, we need to be more compelling in our messages and our approaches. Monitoring, evaluation, and learning approaches are excellent, but they don't often have a scientific basis. Like there's no, there isn't a lot of use of our science information or other types of data that help tell the story of why adaptation is working. And so it ends up going, I think, largely hidden and left behind. And so, I mean, if we could make a charge, you know, to, to really highlighting those stories, explaining how this isn't just something we've been talking about for decades, that it needs to continue, it could be uplifted in ways that refocus our attention. But, you know, it, it, the story tends to get lost, and I think that that's a lot of the reason why they're not balanced, unfortunately. Um, Regarding the indigenous knowledge element, um, this is incredibly important, actually, uh, for us within Applied Sciences, um, or Earth Action. We just recently went through a name change. You're watching the struggle occur in, uh, in real time. But um, in so I work a lot with... Um, Pacific Islander communities um, outside of NASA for, for work on climate and what climate connections to migration look like. Um, but I think because we are partner-centered, uh, the goal is to make sure that we're not developing any solutions that leave people behind. Um, so we have an indigenous uh, peoples program at NASA that, cut, that cross cuts across what we do, ensures that we're working with indigenous uh, leaders to make sure that they're asking the questions, they're telling us how they work, again, so that we're not like throwing something at them or showing up saying like we're going to save the day. The problem is, is that this is also coming at a time when there's an uptick in uh, a lot of the approaches to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And these are things that we should have always been thinking about um, and the sensitivities regarding in impacts to local communities. Um, but as you see in increased knowledge or increased interest, um, which means increased programming around these things, my concern is not whether we're including them, it's that are we actually overtaxing them? Because now you're seeing multiple US government agencies or organizations around the world going to the same communities over and over again and not really coordinating what we need or what we want to do in a way that doesn't overtax the capacities of these, um, these communities. And so we do a lot in that regard, but um, I myself have a lot of um, concern over the volume, the sheer volume of interest in working at more local um, levels with indigenous leaders and simply um, asking too much of them. And so it's a sensitivity, I think, that we need to be able to better balance. Part of that would be if we could get you know, those communities more at the policy tables, right? Where we're, they're working at higher levels, they're informing how we move forward, how we think about things, and therefore, <clears throat> you know, there's not a hundred different organizations flooding a very small village in order to ask, you know, what they need and how we can help them. It's a trade-off. They're always trade-offs. Um, and then, uh, let's see, natural and anthropogenic. I did not write a good enough question for that. Was that question? Help us. There oh, was, I know. Was, I remembered. Sorry. All you had to do was lean forward. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> oh, I always do it. <laughs> um, I have the weirdest prompts. Who knows how my brain works? Um, you know, uh, so a, a disaster happens when there's impacts to lives and livelihoods. Without that, it doesn't happen, right? Um, it's, it's a natural hazard. And so that's the delineation with which we work. Now, um, I, I think the question would be, um, are we talking about earthquakes that are now happening or tremors that are now happening because of you know, how we're releasing volume, like large volumes of water, right? Like you know, the changes between an earthquake that would happen, like plate tectonics, natural not changing because of anthropogenic reasons, but also not a natural disaster either. Um, again, we could have built the community differently to not put them at harm in the first place. 
or we could have retrofitted or like made the building stronger in order to understand, you know, what they could withstand to that hazard. Um, we could also communicate better to the community so that they understood the risk that they were taking on before they moved there in the first place, right? To me, this is a signal. Every time we build in an unsafe place, we're sending the signal to people who don't have the same education that all of us may have, you know, that it is safe. Come live here. You will not die. We will protect you. And it's not, it's not the case, right? I mean, our insurance is falling apart because we're sending those wrong signals. We're building in unsafe places. We're not considering climate change. All of these things are leading to the disasters that we're facing around the world. We knew the hazards existed. We just didn't take them into consideration when we built the societies that we have. And it's very hard to go back. Um, you know, and so in any case, I, I'm pretty, pretty specific about how I see this problem because I think the sensitivities that I have with it, however, are related to cultural beliefs regarding natural hazards. And there's a lot of room there, right? I mean, I'm not going to go around telling other countries that they shouldn't have the belief systems that they do. Um, in many countries, it's still today believed that, you know, that God or, or you know, their, their God is responsible, you know, that there's nothing that they can do. Um, and in those cases, you know, I mean, it, it's holding up a lot of the impacts that, you know, the prevention of impacts that we see. But, you know, I do think as much as we can do to progress in those areas so that we're, you know, either improving response, improving early warning in situations where people have longstanding cultural, you know, or religious beliefs that won't let us move in that direction, um, you know, what can we do to work around it and still help people, you know, alongside, you know, how they live and how they prefer to live. Um, but it, it doesn't end up ever being, for me, a difference between natural hazards um, or not. I blame us, largely speaking. Um, and then, okay, diplomacy. So what is your definition of diplomacy? I find that everybody has a different definition. <laughs> <laughs> it's very challenging. <laughs> um, yeah, it's challenging. So, so, so I have a textbook definition of, of, of diplomacy, but the, the but but basic, so basically it's something about double recognition. So so there is mm. an international actor, an international act is recognized usually a state, mm -hmm. and uh, and then someone uh, has the authority to act on behalf of that state. So so so, so that the double recognition, okay. and then obviously one can one can enlarge that, right? So then one can say, okay, so it's not only state actors, uh, and then we get into science diplomacy mm. and, and, and 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 all of that. And so a broad definition. Okay. And so you want to know whether diplomats are open to these cha these shifts. I would be interested. Yeah. So so because the so when 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 you, when you started, then you several times you used this term framing, right? Yes. And then he said usually when we look at these problems, then 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 people look at them from different points That's of right. view. Yeah. And and my and my and my and. And, I, and I oftentimes, so when, when I look at, let's say, at global health or whatever, I don't look at the things that you look at. Yeah. But then, then uh, there, there oftentimes are oftentimes very different background understandings about, about what's yeah. going on. And it's very, very difficult for, for these people then to talk to one another. Let's say the, 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 the medical doctors or the medical experts somewhere in the World Health Organization yeah. um, with, with, with Diplomats much much more versed in in say economic affairs or mm. or perhaps security or, or something like that. And is that something that, that you that you feel as well when you when you when you so do you find it easy to to bridge the gap towards diplomats or? I do, but I yeah. think it's I think I you know I vacillate between taking for granted the background that I've had, you know, like kind of the fortunate experiences I've had, and then you know, comparing that to other people's knowledge and experiences as well. I, I take for granted um, that, you know, I'm probably way too much of a hard, like I work way too much, you know, I have no personal life <laughs> and I have a lot of interests. And so, um, you know, I, I've worked in water. Water is an absolute, you know, it's like my first passion, um, but I've worked in food security and land management, agroforestry, you know, and so I've worked in infectious diseases and health before um, in small periods of time, but it gave me a much better understanding of the complexities that occur, right? And so, and I think that, um, and maybe I'll just go a step farther to say that Everybody rushes to the door to talk about their issue, but the truth is you're never gonna make headway with anyone 
unless you understand what that person's issue is. So you need to be able to meet people where they are in all settings. Now, we're not all going to be naturally able to do this, and there are definitely things where I'm way out of my element. Actually, if we went way too far the tech angle, I'd, I'd definitely come, come out of my element. But the goal is to be able to understand where they're coming from, understand what their needs are, and be able to under, like, then understand where you or the work you're doing then fits in that regard. And so it's not about me or what my decisions are, but how can I, we can accomplish something together because we have a shared understanding or I can see the value of the work I'm doing in the work of other people. And so, I mean, part of this is helped by having a, a broad experience, um, but for other people, I think it can be helped by doing research, like better understanding the people that you're work with, working with who, or asking them, right? Having frank conversations about the struggles, the challenges they face, et cetera. So it's not insurmountable. I think diplomacy is, I, I, I guess I, I feel that it's so critical that it becomes part of, I think, everything I do. It's way more than handing out NASA stickers, I can assure you. But like, I, I do think that at the beginning of every conversation, for me, it's about the other person, you know, and what they're facing. And then therefore, like any kind of diplomacy approach becomes relatively easy. What does that look like, like, like in the global landscape? It's a it's, it's very complex, <laughs> very complicated. Um, everybody has different needs, different wants. Um, but the truth is, again, I mean, we're not all going to agree, but I also think it's a fallacy to think that we all need to. Um, I think that simply being able to share and understand somehow, sometimes where people come from or where they're coming from, what they're facing, allows us to make some sort of headway. Um, and still support diplomatic processes, even if, you know, somebody doesn't feel like an ultimate winner, like, you know, when they're walking away from a situation. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but it uh, is my I think approach. that's a wonderful <laughs> ending of this. Because <laughs> it ends on a positive note. <laughs> I'm very optimistic. Yeah, that's good. That's <laughs> Way more than many people would like uh, me yes. to be. <laughs> no, but that's good. That's good. That's good. I have a lot of hope. This is how we start. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, you're doomed. You'll never get forward. You have to have an idea. <laughs> yes, yeah. No, let me, let me thank uh, all of you. So uh, the audience uh, for asking very good questions. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, also just I have to say that I'm always very, very happy when I see former students. Uh, there are several uh, in here. Uh, many thanks uh, a lot to the U.S. Embassy for helping us organize this event. And most of all, obviously, Shana, thanks a lot for a great talk. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. <laughs>